Hi. Thank you all for coming. My name is Elvis Pranskevichus, and I'm here today to share a couple of Python hacks that I think are not widely known and that some of you might find useful. But first, a bit about me. I'm a co-founder and CTO of MagicStack and EdgeDB. And we're primarily known in the Python community as maintainers of UV loop, a drop-in replacement for async IO event loop that makes it go fast, and async PG, which is a PostgreSQL client library for async IO, which is also quite fast. And we're also guilty of a few minor changes to the Python language, like the async and await syntax. All right. Uh, these days, I work full-time on EdgeDB, and if it's the first time you hear about it, EdgeDB is a relational database based on Postgres with a new and improved query language, schema definition, language, built-in migration engine, and much more. All of these things are embodied in approximately 200,000 lines of Python, plus 30-odd thousand lines of Rust, Cython, and C, but this talk isn't exactly about HDB, although I could talk about it at four hours or days. Rather, I'd like to talk about some of the challenges we faced while building HDB and how we overcame them with uh, solutions that seemed unobvious at first. The first thing I'd like to talk about is writing network clients. Uh, since HDB is a database server with a distinct wire protocol, uh, it naturally needs a database client library for Python. And we're big fans of writing async-first database clients. Uh, as I mentioned before, we maintain async-pg, so of course we wrote the async version first. And uh, the interface is very simple. We pass a query string and expect a response in return, so this is like a normal database client library. You initialize a client and then you query your database. Well, I don't want to this talk to turn into async IO talk, so I'm not going to tell you a tale of async IO transports and protocols. Uh, so let's pretend the implementation is very trivial uh, and looks something like this. Uh, so we send a query message to the server, and then we basically expect the server to return us a response message. So this is all very straightforward, and at this point, we're done. Our, our database client is complete. And, uh, but having finished congratulating ourselves with successfully writing another database client, we remember that, sadly, not everybody uses async IO, and that we also need to provide a non-async version of our client. So what are our options? Well. We could take all the async code and copy it and strip async await. And you can do that manually, just copy paste and then get, delete all the async await keywords and hopefully it works with minor modifications. And, but essentially if you do it manually, that means that you're effectively doubling your maintenance burden or even worse, you can forget to you know, fix or port some bugs from one version to another. And so it's just not, not very nice. Uh, you can maybe automate async await stripping uh, with some code mode script that does this for you. So you, whenever you modify your golden version, uh, which is the async version, you just go and strip the keywords and uh, uh, run it that way. Unfortunately, it's also probably error prone because it's, it's not that easy, and also it requires an explicit build step now. So you, it's not no longer a pure Python project. Now you have a make file or some other thing that, that uh, or a pre-commit hook. So it just complicates things, and it's generally really, really ugly. Okay, so another option is, well, let's just do a sync IO run. Let's, let's start an event loop, uh, run our coroutine in that event loop, and shut it down. And you do it on every invocation of your uh, async method when you, whenever you run a query. And that works, except it's probably going to be super slow because starting an event loop is not a free operation. Shutting it down isn't either. And uh, what's worse 
if somehow your program uses the same driver and you already have an event loop running somewhere, this whole thing will just crash. Um, so what to do? What are our options? Well, fortunately, routines in Python are kind of a generator, or they are exactly like generators, but um, a special kind of generator. They used to be the same. And so we can actually call, invoke that coroutine. We can call it by calling its send method uh, with uh, a non-argument. And that starts the coroutine. So let's see what would our most primitive event loop look like. This is basically it. Let's break this down. First, like I mentioned, we call send with none. And that starts the coroutine. And then when a coroutine returns, like an iterator or generator, it raises a stop iteration exception with the return value as its argument. So we preserve that and pass it to our caller. And then remember that it's a synchronous world, so our callers don't really expect any concurrency, so our event loop must ensure that the coroutine that we're calling uh, is able to complete in single iteration. Um, so this is an explicit check for that. We're not ex actually expecting the coroutine that we're calling to actually be a coroutine that enters and exits multiple times. And this is the key part. Uh, in order for any of this to work, uh, no coroutine in the call stack can yield. All right, let's go back to how we are actually invoking our async implementation. So we await on a query call, then that uh, calls the query, then that might call some nested coroutines, and finally we reach the await on a read message on our socket or some other transport. And normally this is where uh, the, the socket would return and uh, it would be an unblocking socket, so it would return a future that completes whenever there is data. But if there is not any data, it will yield back to the event loop, which would pause the task and maybe run some other tasks that have the opportunity to run. Well, of course, we cannot yield in this particular point because we don't have any event loop. We just have our trivial function that tries to iterate our coroutine, and that's it. All right, so what do we do? Well, it turns out that if all you need is to read from that socket at the end of your call stack and your uh, network client, then the only thing you need to do is to basically re-implement that portion and make the socket blocking, right? So just block in the socket like any normal synchronous program would do. And voila, this is our sync client. The only thing we need to do is write the very thin facade on top of our async definition, and we have a fully functional synchronous version of our client without any code duplication. So this is basically the holy grail, right? You can have one version of the source code, uh, and it can run both in both sync and async way. Great, but what are the caveats? Well, of course, Calling an async function, even if it doesn't yield, is still somewhat more expensive than a normal function call. So you're still incurring some overhead there. But it's really, in this case, it's negligible because the majority of that latency is spent actually calling the server and waiting for it to respond. So you wouldn't really see any difference. And the most important uh, caveat is that, of course, the async implementation of your client driver cannot use any event loop facility. So you cannot do uh, async I/O sleep, you cannot create tasks, you cannot do any of that. You cannot gather. That obviously requires concurrency, and we don't have any concurrency, but this is a synchronous program, so it's, it's, that's expected. All right, so that's how you do synchronous versions of client drivers on top of async implementation. This is what we did with HDB Python, which is a client library for, for HDB.
All right, let's move on to our next issue. We're still building our dream database, so now we need to implement a schema definition language and uh, a schema migration system. So let's see how that would work. Let's imagine that we have a database schema like this, and this is an HDB database schema declaration language. Uh, so it's a really super simple schema with uh, just two types in it. Super cool. And then let's imagine that at some point later, uh, the user uh, developer writing, working on this application decided to, uh, to modify the schema by adding the age property and, uh, to the person type and they also modified the movie type with uh, making that property required. So this is a, like a, something that uh, people normally do on a regular basis when they're working on their application. All right. So for this change, uh, HDB would generate a migration like this. Uh, and if you were to use Django or Django ORM, you would, uh, it would help you to generate a similar migration. Okay, great. So, but since we're implementing our own database, and we do it in Python, let's see how that might look. All right. So this is, this is the piece of implementation, an imaginary piece of implementation that could take that migration and do something with it. So let's assume that our schema is a dictionary of uh, data classes, where every item just represents something in the schema, like a table or a column or something like that. So uh, that previous migration, we are implementing it here with just two simple lines of Python code. And finally, we're returning the schema. But what happens if something goes wrong in the middle of that migration? What happens if the first item succeeded, but the second did not? So we are kind of halfway through mutation of our schema. And if, if you remember that the schemas can be large and complicated, so what do we do? We need to roll back that essentially migration transaction. So we must find and undo all the changes we made so far. And that's, that's really, really hard and tedious uh, to do in general. And uh, another point to consider is that it's, if this is a database, and it's naturally a multi-user database, and so more than one client will be connecting and doing things. And in this case, uh, some concurrent connection might be actually attempting to like read your database while you're mutating its schema. And if, if that happens simultaneously and you don't place any protections, you, you, uh, you get essentially undefined behavior. So it seems like databases solve this by doing something that's called transaction isolation, right? And normally what you would do, you would do some sort of uh, snapshot isolation. So the simplest way to do that isolation for our schema would be to simply take that dict that represents it and make a copy of it before we try to modify it. That way the shared state would be protected and it will only get replaced once we've successfully completed all of the operations. Of course, we can also need to make sure that we're not mutating the objects that are contained in that uh, schematic directly either. So we are doing this uh, essentially data class replace on, on a property of, of all the objects that we're mutating. So this is great. We now have snapshot isolation. There's a small snag though. Large schemas can potentially contain thousands or tens of thousands of items in that dict, right? Because you need to, to track all of the tables, types, properties, constraints, indexes, all of it. So uh, a 30,000 item schema is not a rarity. And while dict copy is quite fast, because it essentially is just copying a bunch of memory and fixing some pointers, it's still an ON operation, right? It's not fast enough if you have too many items to copy. So if you can see this on this uh, rather unscientific looking chart, um, it takes 
an order of millisecond to copy a dig that has a couple of tens of thousands of items, which considering that we're running a database is a very long time because Postgres can run a complex SQL query in that time. And what all we're doing is just copying some weird dict. Um, so that doesn't really work for us. So clearly we need a new, better data structure for, for to represent our schema that can potentially solve this issue. Fortunately, some time ago, um, Yuri and I were working on adding context variables to Python in PEP 5.50 and PEP 5.6.7, where there was a similar need to copy potentially large maps uh, of context variables on every context switch. So if you're using context vars in async IO, uh, that's essentially uh, holds the state that is local to the task. And when you're switching the task, the task context um, and adding some items, we need to essentially very uh, quickly copy that state. So the solution to that came in the form of a data structure called HAMT, which is, stands for Hash Array Map Try. Uh, it's used in Haskell, Scala, Clojure, and maybe some other languages to, um, to implement their native uh, dict types, uh, the persistent maps. And now, of course, it also underpins the context vars module in Python. All right, so let's see how that works and how that is different from regular dicts. So this is how you create that, uh, that map. And this is how you essentially mutate it, except you don't mutate it. You are uh, creating a copy of it with that mutation in place. And you, now you have a reference to both versions, both the old version and the new version. This is not unlike tuples, where we obviously cannot modify tuples, they're immutable, but we can concatenate them and uh, retain references to both. All right, so why is HMT different? Why, why is it better in this particular use, use case? Uh, why is it better than a di regular dict? So if you recall, dicts are essentially hash maps, right? So what, what under, underpins the dict is a hash table where keys are indexes into essentially an array of pointers. And those indexes are determined by the hash key, uh, by the hash of the keys, All right? And so if you modify uh, that dict and if you want to implement that persistent map that retains the, a copy, uh, that retains a pointer to a reference to a previous version of it, you essentially need to copy this entire array of pointers. And this is what dict.copy does. But if that array is super, super large, it's still very slow, right? Slow for our use case. So what's different about HMT is that it's a tree, it's a hash try, right? A hash tree, hash, hash tries, is, tries are specific kinds of trees where instead of a really long, flat array of pointers, you get a tree of pointers. And every node in that tree is fairly small because that tree contains may, may, may contain like up to five levels, depending on how you are splitting your hash. It essentially splits the hash of key into bits, uh, um, pairs of bits, and every level in the tree is, is a rep representation of that uh, pair of bits. And so, then whenever we modify, uh, we add an item to a persistent map like that, we only need to copy that those little nodes that are fairly small that lead to that item in that tree. So if you, if you imagine a tree has a lot of branches, we only need to copy one branch. And that one branch would be uh, significantly less work than copying an entire dict containing tens of thousands of items. And so this is how it looks, right? Uh, it's our old dict implementation with a copy and uh, the equivalent operation on the persistent map. So you can see it's basically a straight line. It's not exactly a straight line, but the <laughs> scale of this graph uh, makes it appear as, as such because it's a logarithmic scale, right? Uh, the complexity of modifying a persistent map is uh, logarithm and uh, a dict is uh, 
proportional. It's O n. All right. So, how would our migration implementation look with a persistent map? Well, we just replace the dict with a map, and uh, instead of mutating it in place, we're calling the set, and we're getting a reference to a new modified version with every step. So, if something happens anywhere uh, in in um, in this flow, uh, we we have the reference to the old version. So we can easily roll back. We can just throw away the partially mutated schema and continue as nothing ha has happened. And this also gets us naturally transaction isolation because uh, we only replace the master point to that schema whenever the migration completes successfully. Before that, no other clients see it. So we're not, although we have shared state, that shared state is immutable. All right, so you might say, okay, so but I'm not implementing databases in my day job. Why do I need any of this? Like, why? Why is this? Why? How does this matter to me? Well, let's look at another another example. Let's imagine we're writing an app that lets users split bills and expenses. For example, when friends are traveling or going out, uh, each user has an account balance, and we'll again represent that as a dictionary. So a key would be a username and uh, the value would be their balance in, say, cents. And then we'll implement two simple functions, withdraw and deposit, to take and put money into accounts correspondingly, taking care uh, to not overdraw the account. All right. And now, let's imagine we have three users, Alice, Bob, and Carol, who went out and had a nice dinner. And Carol picked up the check to avoid the hassle of splitting it on the spot. We know how it all goes because the server really, really hates you when you ask them to split the bill. And so a function that implements a transaction that settles that amount um, might look something like this. Unfortunately, we run into the same problem of having to expensively roll back our transaction if uh, the mutation fails at any point. But if we implement this in terms of our persistent map, this problem goes away. So this is essentially how you can um, use this in your own application if you have a problem like this. Whenever you mutate some shared state and your operation is sufficiently non-trivial so that you need to roll it back if something happens, or you need to share that state, or you need to isolate it. Uh, immutable data structure, specifically immutable map, is a great way to do this. And it's actually available on PyPI as a module, so you can pip install immutables and use it in your app. They're great. All right, um, now the title of this talk says three hacks, so there's a bonus hack, which is not really a hack, but rather a recommendation that uh, I find very, very, very useful. Um, if you find yourself writing code like this, uh, especially if that if a lif uh, ladder tends to get very, very, very long, do yourself a favor and use single dispatch. Really, it's available in all Python versions that are relevant, and it's, it's great, especially if you're lucky enough to work on a compiler where uh, you need to traverse AST nodes all, all day long. And it's even nicer if you, uh, if you have type annotations in your code, then uh, it's just very minimal uh, annotation. But this applies to values too. If you have a super long if-else or match ladder uh, conditioned on some value, consider dispatching too especially if uh, handler uh, implementations are in different modules, right? So you have like this really big dispatch and you have to maintain this uh, unwieldy large function that dispatches over those. Uh, use value dispatch. It's great. So this isn't actually part of the standard library, but it's relatively easy to implement, and if you need inspiration, take a look at the uh, 
um, at the example in um, in the NGDB GitHub repo over there. All right, that's it from me. Anyway, I think we have a bit of time for questions. Yeah, yes, thank you, Alice, for your talk. Um, yeah, we have still four uh, minutes for the questions. In case you have some, please line up uh, near this microphone over there and feel free to ask. Over there. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so about the last tip, uh, are there any performance improvements, or is it only like to make the code cleaner and prettier? Uh, so it's a great question. If you use single dispatch. Um, based on types of the standard library single dispatch, it is actually beneficial because it maintains a cache. Because uh, each instance is not really that fast if you have a complex class hierarchy or multiple inheritance or some, uh, something like that. So it's actually, well, you need to do your own benchmarks, but usually it's actually faster. Um, but of course, maintaining it, it leads to clean up code. That's the most important part. Value dispatch, uh, of course, it depends on how you would implement it because there is no one single canonical implementation, so it depends. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hello. So back to your first tip, like creating sync uh, API from uh, on top of the async one. Uh, well, you said that we need to create some kind of, I'll say it, a dummy event loop that just uh, calls, uh, calls send. But then, uh, when we have some functions that yield, like your receive message in your example, uh, then we have to actually override it and use the synchronous function. So I guess th this, we have to analyze uh, our whole code base and dependencies and provide synchronous overrides for all such, uh, all such places where uh, when the async stack can yield. Is that right? Yes, that's right. But uh, normally, what, what this was discussing is a network client. So normally, when you're writing network clients, those are usually like HTTP clients in, interfacing with some API. So usually, the only thing that would yield in that uh, client is the socket. Right, so you, you just need to replace the, that connection that you're passing to, to your client, and that's it. Of course, if it's something more elaborate, then yeah, you need to, uh, you need to go through and make sure that uh, you can actually successfully iterate that coroutine and execute it as a normal function, essentially. It's, what this hack basically means is that you're, even though you wrote your uh, client as an async program, it's, it, it, it really is just syntactic. Right, so it just basically it's a, it's a chain of uh, of awaits uh, blocking on the socket read somewhere down there, so it saves you from the need to change that syntax back to sync to maintain two source code versions. But if your async implementation is again is, is something more complex that requires concurrency that actually uses event loop like tasks background like task groups or uh, waits on multiple tasks at the same time, then you know uh, this wouldn't work. Or it would if, if you refactor things and make sure you have a version of your async code that doesn't have that, those things or turns them off. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you once again and thank you for your questions. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any more time uh, for other questions, but please feel free to contact Elvis via Discord. Thank you again for your talk.